to talk today about my favorite subject, which is exploring the designs of nature. So I've been doing this for quite a while. This is me in graduate school. And I got a job doing the special effects on the first Superman film. And when you film starts, you see that you're flying over the planet Krypton. It's actually human pancreatic cancer cells in culture that I was photographing right there. So things aren't always as they seem. So I've been using microscopes for many, many years, both as a scientist and as an artist. I moved to, uh, back to Los Angeles and uh, became an assistant professor at USC and began studying the development of embryos. I was looking at chick embryos. And what happens early in development, the embryo folds up and looks kind of like a taco. And there's a neural tube there that, along the backside that becomes the spinal cord, and the forward, the forward part becomes the brain and the eyes. And if there's a, a problem with the closure of the neural tube, there are some very severe birth defects that happen. So I was studying this. And I was up, unable to see clearly what was happening because there weren't microscopes that allowed me to see with good depth of field and in 3D and good contrast to look at living unstained cells. So I started bringing my knowledge of photography and invented some new types of 3D microscopes. So it turns out microscopes have always just had one light coming straight up and looking at things. Well, I knew as a photographer, you, you would never light a scene that way. You'd have key light, fill light, backlight. You'd bring out the objects that you want to see. So I started doing that with microscopes. So my first microscope had eight different lights, four from the bottom, four from the top, coming at different angles. And lo and behold, it increased the resolution, the contrast, the depth of field, and also the side effect was is you got 3D out of the whole thing. So that was a big surprise to me. And I've been doing this for many, many years. This is my latest microscope, a digital microscope. And I've been filming rather extraordinary things for many years. So this, you can see, is a single brain cell. Uh, I came from a lab at University College London that did a lot of neurobiology. So this single brain cell, you can see it as a cell body and a tree-like structure that receives input from hundreds and hundreds of other cells. And then there's a little tiny axon that comes out the other end. And after all that input, it sends a signal out to other cells in the network. And this allows you to do things like play a piano or catch a ball. These are called Purkinje cells, and they're incredibly beautiful cells. About 12 years ago, I moved to Maui. I found that there was an amazing world around me of just sand and flowers and food and ordinary stuff. So if you look at this scene here, you've all seen it. But there's a whole hidden world here that you can't see. If you take a drop of that ocean water and put it under a microscope, there's an entire world there that will blow your mind. If you take a handful of sand and look at it, it's quite amazing. This is sand from South Point in Hawaii through a microscope. So this thing is, is olivine, which is a mineral. And it's a characteristic of shield volcanoes, which we have in Hawaii. Uh, so uh, I only have this one picture of sand, but sand is quite incredible and, and, and amazing looking. And so are flowers. So this is the state flower of Hawaii, is the hibiscus. And when I got to Hawaii, I was amazed that this flower just was so upfront with its sexuality. I mean, just the stamen and the pistol was just really out there. So I got really fascinated with this particular flower. And I started photographing it from many different angles, and I started to put it under the microscope. So I want to just give for a minute a little homage to Georgia O'Keeffe, who in the 1920s started looking at flowers very closely. And she realized that people didn't have the time to look closely at flowers. And she thought, well, if I can, if I can paint these flowers big enough, people just can't ignore them. So she started painting these incredible pictures of flowers, really big, so you really couldn't ignore them. Um, and just to show you that she wasn't exaggerating, and she didn't do it particularly for the sensuality of it. She just wanted to show you the beauty of the flowers. But if you look at, this is a picture through the microscope of the stigma of a little coral tree flower. So just to show she wasn't exaggerating the sensuality of things. This is the female part of the coral tree flower. That's the coral tree flower right there. And there's a little, I'm just going to, that part there, that's what we're photographing. That's the female part. This is the male part there, and that's what it looks like through a microscope. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at the female parts uh, through a microscope, they look kind of phallic. And when you look at the male parts, they look more vaginal. So it's sort of a little twist in the design of things with, with flowers. So I came up with the idea. I wanted to start looking at flowers from the bug's eye point of view. If you're a bug right in a flower, 
you're seeing things like, you're not seeing it the way we see it. You're right up against the stigma and the, and the, and the stamen and the, and the pollen. And, and uh, so that's how I wanted to show people flowers. So if you were this little bug sitting on that flower, what would that petal look like? Well, it looks something like that through a microscope because that's, that's how that bug would see it. In fact, it also, bugs also see in UV light. I'm not going to show you that today, but they see even other colors than we do. So I want to talk a little bit about the birds and the bees because for flowers, it's all about sex. That's what it is. Flowers are out there to have pollinators be attracted to them and get caught up in the pollen and pollinate the flowers. Um, so most flowers, by the way, are hermaphrodites. So flowers uh, have male characteristics and they have female characteristics. Not all, but many, many flowers have both male and female characteristics. So looking at the hibiscus, on the left side you can see the male characteristics are, are, are the, uh, the anther, the pollen, and the filament which holds the anther. And uh, the anther develops and the pollen comes out. That's the male characteristics. The female characteristics are the pistil, which consists of the, the stigma, which is at the very top. That's the receptive part of the flower. That's the part that receives the pollen grains. And then there's the, 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 the style, which runs down the center of the flower, all the way down to the ovary and the ovules. So if you look uh, at this close-up shot of the hibiscus, you can see that in this particular case, the hibiscus has a, a ball-shaped stigma and very beautiful, bright yellow uh, pollen. Here's looking a little bit closer. And if you look a little bit closer, actually, in a microscope, this is the kind of thing you see. It's a whole other world. It's a completely other world, and these are little bits of, of nectar. These are spurs of nectar that attract the insects to come and eat and so forth. So here's an example of what happens. This is like a little Willy Wonka land for this little bug. <laughs> it's, it's like in heaven. It's surrounded by nectar, and it lives there, and it eats, and it, 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 it reproduces there. So it's, it's a happy little creature. So what it does, as it moves around, these little bugs move around, they get pollen caught in their wings and their legs, and they go from flower to flower. So they'll occasionally deposit a little grain of pollen on a similar, on the same species, but a different flower, and they'll deposit it right on the stigma. And you can see one grain of pollen there. And what will happen is, it's quite amazing, and you'll see with this long shot, you can barely see on the very left top of the stigma, the tiny little yellow dot. That's what we just were looking at before. That grain of pollen, has two cells in it. It has a vegetative cell and a reproductive cell. The vegetative cell starts to drill a hole down and creates a pollen tube, which goes right down the middle of the style. I'm going to show you this a little closer. All the way down, it created that pollen tube, and it brings the sperm cell, which is, has two sperm cells come down, and it then interacts with the, with the ovules in the ovary. So the ovary is that round part there, and the ovules become seeds. So that's the birds and the bees. Now the birds come in because when the seeds are dropped, the birds will eat the seeds, they'll fly off and they can start a new, a new colony of, flower, of, of that plant a long distance away. Um, so I want to show you just a couple of examples of different sorts of, of, uh, of beautiful designs in nature. This is a, 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 a Royal Poinciana tree, and you can see that's the stigma of the royal poinciana tree. It looks quite different than the stigma of the, uh, of, of the hibiscus flower. This is, this is a flower, uh, a, a white ginger, and you can see it's got this beautiful green stigma, and the, and the, and the, uh, the um, anther and the pollen is just below it in that stem, and then the stem uh, continues to go down. That's the close-up through a microscope of what that looks like. So usually the pollen and the stigma are quite sticky, so that when the bug moves around, it has a better chance of, of, of pollinating. This is a little impatience flower, which many of you have seen. It has two forms. It has a male form, and then it goes to a, a female form. Uh, you're seeing the female form there on the right-hand side. Uh, this, is, this is the male version of it. Every little bump there is a cell, a little tiny cell. Now, I want to talk a little bit about leaves, because leaves do, uh, it's, it's a miracle. It's, what they do is they perform the magic. They make food out of thin air. They take carbon dioxide uh, and water and sunlight, and they turn it into sugar. Now, I just want to show you a little cartoon of this, because it's really an amazing trick they do. So on the left side, you can see there's six molecules of carbon dioxide. Carbon is the black. Um, there's there's uh, six uh, molecules of water. 
uh, and you can see there. And with the sunlight, it rearranges those and puts them together into a carbon chain. It actually makes a carbon ring, finally. And that is what we call sugar. Now you notice, and there's what's left over is six molecules of oxygen. So if you count all the red balls on the left, it's the same number of red balls on the right, same number of black on the left as there is on the right, and the same with the white. So it's the same actual uh, um, uh, elements, but they come together to make an energy source called glucose. To do this, leaves have to be able to breathe. So if you look at this shot of leaves through a microscope, you're going to notice there's some structures that look like little lips. And what they do is they open and close because they have to breathe in carbon dioxide and then the byproduct is oxygen, so they have to expel oxygen. So they can't be doing this continuously or the flower would dry out. So these little things called stomata open and close. There are a lot of other interesting things that leaves have. They have these, or flowers have in general, called trichomes. And these little structures are wonderful little three-dimensional structures. They can, uh, they do multiple things. They can, they can be glands. They can be, uh, in case what you saw earlier, they were spurs of, of nectar. They can uh, protect the flower. Uh, they can keep the flower, from, they can trap water, keep it from drying out and so forth. And they're quite beautiful. So this is the trichomes of a lavender flower. It's filled with trichomes. And it has a lot of the aroma that lavender has that you're familiar with. So here's looking at a leaf of a basil leaf, and you can see that there's these secretory areas where just these beautiful basil oil is, is being, so if you touch the basil and smell your finger, that's, that's what you're touching there. Here's a similar situation with rosemary. It's just oozing out this wonderful, wonderful oils that we like to eat. Um, so we're used to flowers by seeing the petals. Uh, petals are the thing that attracts the flowers. It attracts the pollinators from a distance. And it tells them where, where to land, where, where is the landing space. Uh, and one petal is more beautiful than the other, as, as we all know. So we, we appreciate the petals a lot. We, and when we look really close, that's that part of, that's the middle of that petal right there. Every little bump there is a cell. And every cell knows is there because the DNA in every cell there tells it what color it should be, where it should be, to create the entire design and pattern. So what I want to do now is just show you a little movie, a uh, five-minute movie. A flower does not talk, wrote one Zen abbot. Flowers don't tell, they show. But what do they show? That depends on who's looking and what they're looking for. It was in the 1920s, when nobody had time to reflect, that I saw a still life painting with a flower that was perfectly exquisite, but so small you could really not appreciate it. I decided that if I could paint that flower in a huge scale, you could not ignore its beauty. If I could paint the flower exactly as I see it, no one else would see what I see because I would paint it small, like the flower is small. So I said to myself, I'll paint what I see, what the flower is to me, but I'll paint it big, and they will be surprised into taking time to look at it. the microscope. What do you see? What is a flower? A giant sexual organ in its Sunday best.
I suppose that flowers, when they're through blooming, have some sort of awareness of some purpose having been served. In a flaming burst, they kiss the earth, shout to the sky, white, pink, yellow. Orchards of plums and peaches, acres of mustard greens from the ten directions, spring brings on flowers, flowers bring on spring. yellow poppies are time. These green fruits of white flowers are time. These brown seeds of orange fruits are time. When you take a flower in your hand and really look at it, it's your world for the moment.